Dialogue is taped on location at the Lindsay Inn. Fleming, this is Dialogue with Ray Fleming. Welcome to the new season. I have three guests today. Uh, on my immediate right is Paul McIver. In the, in the middle is George Bradbury. And on the extreme left is Pat Dunn. Paul is the founder of a new political party in Canada, the Freedom Party of Canada, uh, which um, was, is just, just recently founded. I think if I remember correctly, Paul has told me the 20th of July was the founding date. Uh, he's an employment lawyer in Toronto and Oshawa, and he's a graduate of Trent University and University of Western Ontario. He's married, and he has a wife and two young sons. George Bradbury has lived in the area since 1965. He's a retired secondary school teacher and a former United Church minister. Pat Dunn is director, a director of the Alliance Party of Canada and a former candidate in the November election of last year. Uh, he has lived in Lindsay since 1968. Welcome all three of you. Our, our topic uh, is, is, is going to be politics and uh, uh, we'll, we'll start with you, Paul. Uh, you're the founder of, an, of, a, of a new party, not necessarily a new party in Canada, but the federal version of that party. Tell us a little bit about the Freedom Party of Canada. Well, actually, I am not really the founder per se. This mm -hmm. is a party that has existed at the provincial level mm -hmm. uh, since 1984, mm -hmm. initially founded by uh, Mark Emery and uh, Robert Metz. Mm -hmm. uh, it has come to the point where we see a crisis at the federal level. Mm -hmm. People are not being given an option to uh, vote for a party of principle. And so Given that, I mean, given the voter apathy, the party has decided to uh, offer its uh, brand of politics, if you will, to uh, people Canada-wide. So the province has been, the, the party has been in the province of Ontario for a good number of years. Absolutely. About more than 10, is it? 12, 15? 17 years. 17. Started uh, January 1st, 1984. Yes. Am I right on the, on this 20th of July date that you, this party is as new as the 20th of July? That's correct. It federally, I mean. Federally. Now, what's the point in taking it federally when there is already a provincial party? And are there other provincial freedom parties across the Canada, uh, the country? Uh, there are not. Ontario is the only party. Uh, so why go federal right at this at this point? The federal jurisdiction is quite different from the uh, provincial jurisdiction. Federal issues include uh, issues of uh, criminal law, mm -hmm. issues of monetary policy, etc. Mm -hmm. And a party operating at the provincial level cannot really speak with any credibi credibility at the federal level on those federal issues. Mm -hmm. So the time has come for Freedom Party to extend and open its uh, federal branch, if you will. So here we have another party. Haven't we already had new parties which have not succeeded? The, it's, it's, isn't it impossible to get rid of the Liberals? I mean, uh, I assume that's one of your principal reasons for founding the free Freedom of Party federally, the Freedom Party of Canada f federally. Our, our, our focus is not on defeating any party in particular, mm -hmm. rather in offering Canadians a party that they can actually uh, get excited about and uh, feel that is a party that's making principled policies rather than one that simply looks at the, the polls of the day and says, oh look, if we propose this law, they'll keep us in office. If we give them this tax cut or this money, they'll keep us in so, office. So you're, in other words, you're claiming that the Freedom Party of Canada is a party of principles. Exactly. Doesn't every par party claim that? It's easy to claim. It's not easy to do. And, and how can we know you'll be any different from? Well, the Freedom Party has a track record, and this is one of the things we're offering at the federal level. We're offering a track record based on 17 years at the provincial level. Uh, Freedom Party has been consistent in uh, for example, on the issue of taxation, it's been uh, active in the various communities, opposing business taxes, uh, getting out in the street, actually attending uh, human rights tribunals when there are injustices occurring there, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, making uh, proposals or submissions to uh, various committees when they are mm -hmm. when they are struck. Mm -hmm. So we have a we have a consistent uh, record of action that's all actually available at the FreedomParty.org mm -hmm. website mm -hmm. for anyone to view. 
Uh, there should be no question about our, our consistency. And that's one of the things that we're, we're able to offer Canadians that maybe the other parties can't do. Consistency based on no power. Well, I mean, you have to admit that we've, you've never been in power anywhere. Oh, absolutely, we've never we've never uh, uh, taken a seat in the Ontario Legislature. Uh, but that is not to say that we have no power. Uh, if you look at the the policies that were being proposed by the party uh, from its inception, 1984, mm -hmm. for example, you will see that uh, the party was consistently, for example, in favor of uh, user fees or privatization of such things as health care. Mm -hmm which only now that it's politically popular, the Liberals are thinking about discussing in public. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason we were proposing it back then was because we were based back then on the exact same principle we're based on now. Mm -hmm. And that is that every person in the peaceful you know, pursuit of his own personal happiness mm -hmm. has an absolute right to his own. I think you use the terms life, liberty, and property. Life, liberty, and property, that's Those correct. are the sort of three planks on which the party is built. That's, that's basically the guiding principle upon which every policy that we offer is built. Uh, whether popular or not, our policies are always aimed at being consistent with that statement of principle. Maybe what I'll do now, Paul, is, is give the, the other two guests, Pat Dunn and George Bradbury, a, a moment, to, if, just in case something you've said so far has sparked a question. Uh, sure, I can sure. see that George has a, uh, an inquisitive <laughs> look on his face and is ready to ask, and, and, and probably Pat is the same way. Uh, George, have you a question so far about uh, what Paul has said? Well, the whole question of happiness, for example, the pursuit of happiness is, is, is something that I really don't understand because it seems to me that happiness is not something you can pursue. Happiness for me is a byproduct and as a result of that I don't understand how one can go about pursuing happiness. That's fair enough. I guess we make the distinction about pursuing happiness versus being given it on a silver platter. Um, everyone is free to seek to be happy, to conduct themselves in a peaceful way in an effort to become happy. But not, uh, it's abs absolutely antithetical to that, to say that a person should be forced to make somebody else happy. And so we make the, we make the uh, statement that a person, as long as they're in the peaceful pursuit of personal happiness, they're not hurting others. Uh, then they do have an absolute right to their, their life, liberty, and property in that circumstance. But Pat, I would, I would think your question, if, if I may be so bold as to, to, uh, uh, to guess, would be um, as, a, as a member of the Alliance Party with all the, the troubles, the difficulties, the failures that the Alliance Party has had in the last six months, wouldn't you say to, to Paul, don't do it, give up now. It's not possible to succeed in, in a, with a new party. It's, it's, it's just too difficult. Absolutely not. That may be your question, but my question is right off the bat. <laughs> what you're disobeying me. <laughs> it's the question of health care. Uh, you know, Paul just made a statement that it's politically popular to have user fees for health care. I don't believe it is politically popular. I think user fees are, are, are destructive because only, only the, the wealthy or the fairly well off can afford to pay user fees. So what we're doing right off the bat is we're denying the, 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 the poor people in our community, the, the helpless people in our, our community med medical care. You know, so I don't believe it's a politically popular idea, and I challenge that statement. Well, here, here's my response to that. I mean, we, we are popularly uh, pr uh, presented with this argument that if you allow user fees, we'll have a two-tier system of health care. The reality is that we do have a two-tier system of health care. It's just that our only competitor right now happens to be in the United States. So if you are on death's door, if you're being denied, denied cancer treatment, as we've recently seen for as much as three months, if you've got a uh, uh, heart problem that needs to be addressed immediately, oftentimes people are mortgaging their house or doing what they need to do to get to the south because the uh, socialized system in, the, in Canada is not, uh, not serving their needs. It is popular to people who are ill and not able to get attention. It might not be popular to people who don't yet trust the very same system that we already had in place in 1968 and that was working quite fine. In fact, when healthcare became socialized in 1968, Canadians actually riled, uh, raised uh, their voice against the idea. It may be popular with the political elite and the wealthy, but I'll have to go back to my original statement. Yeah. The, um, there, was a, there was a resolution passed, passed by the PCs to uh, bring in user fees for the first three, four hundred dollars. But the thing is there's a lot of people in our society that simply cannot afford to pay the first three or four hundred dollars. 
and we're now going to, or uh, under your system, we're going to introduce a health care system that automatically denies them that. If they can't pay the first three or four hundred dollars, they don't get anything. Well, keep so it. I think what we have to do is we have to find a health care system and we have to fund it properly. Mm -hmm. The funding, the, the, the problem is federal funding. It's not the health care system, it's the funding. Well, now that's an interesting statement because the Canadian Alliance, at least in its uh, reform uh, embodiment, was actually opposed to federal funding for health care outright. It recognized health care, as the Freedom Party does, as an exclusively provincial matter. I don't know if they've changed their policy, but it wouldn't surprise me if they have. Um, they seem to be changing a few policies uh, lately. But uh, that's one of the reasons we're offering a principled alternative. The Canadian, the, the Canadian Alliance Party is not the Reform Party, just for, just for a start. I, I understand okay. that. And, and the Canadian Alliance uh, position on health care is to main, maintain the, uh, the, the six points of health care and add one more, which is guaranteed long-term funding. That's our policy. Now, regardless of what other people may have or may have not said about the values of two-tier system, the policy of the party is guaranteed health care for all Canadian citizens, and it has to be accessible. And by bringing in user fees, you're denying access to a, to a large portion of our uh, population. I, well, suppose, I suppose I could also ask you, well, then, what's the difference between Alliance and Liberal then on health care? Exactly. But, but we're not really... We're shifting the focus well, there. Well, if you want to ask that question, just very briefly, is the Liberals refuse to meet their responsibilities to fund health care. And we're saying that they should be met. See, this is the problem that we, we see all the time. What we have here is a party that now is distinguishing itself from the other party on the basis that, well, we'll really do it. Not on the basis of what they'll do. Mm -hmm. And so when people are presented with three choices at the ballot box, they say, here's one that'll give me socialized medicine, here's one that'll give me socialized medicine, here's one that'll give me socialized medicine, what does it matter? If I'm happy with socialized medicine, it doesn't matter which one I vote for. And if I'm not happy with socialized medicine, again, it doesn't matter which one I vote for. So by, pro by, by providing an alternative con to Canadians and saying, look, if you think socialized medicine is so great, get in the lineup and find out, and saying, we're the only party being give, giving you the opportunity to open the market up so that you can purchase, you, there'll be competition in the price of your uh, health insurance. There'll be competition in the hospitals. There'll be competition among doctors. No longer you, will you be sitting in a, in a uh, waiting room with people looking down their nose saying, look, it's all we've got. You're going to have to wait three hours. Rather, they'll be begging for your dollars. They'll be working very hard to keep a smile on your face. I suppose one of the advantages, in theory, of, of, of the Freedom Party's uh, platform on health is, is a cap on spending or something on spending. That, that, that's a problem that the, both the Liberals and, the, and, and now the Alliance and I expect the Conservatives, too, have, is, is that if you start asking the federal government to fill in the gaps, and, and uh, I think uh, Stockwell Day said when he was in Lindsay, uh, when was it, um, a year or more ago, said uh, that, the, the, that uh, the federal government's uh, percentage is way down from what it was 10 years ago in spending on health. The problem is health keeps soaring in cost, mm -hmm. and who's going to put a cap on it? Can we afford to do what you well, there's, there's actually there's actually yeah. a, a distinction there. It's not that the Freedom Party would put a cap on federal spending. Mm -hmm. It's that it doesn't believe that federal the federal government should be involved in health care at all. Mm -hmm. at, I mean, at, at present, there's a big belief that the federal health care system uh, is, or the federal funding for health care is this big, enormous amount of money. In reality, it's a very tiny amount. It's just enough money there to make the uh, Prime Minister have a, have a smile on his face and say that he's doing something for health care. If you actually look at the money and where it's coming from, it's usually coming from the province to the province, not from the federal government. It's not like a big sacrifice would occur where the federal government to vacate that area. And the Constitution requires that provinces be able to manage their health care as they see fit. Holding a few million dollars, which is a small potatoes in the billion dollar industry we call health care, holding a few million dollars over the heads of the provinces and saying, well, we're running the show and you're going to run your health care system the way we do is totally unacceptable. We'll come back to that point after we have about a one minute break. Sure. Before our break, we were talking about the health care system in Canada and we had various uh, points of view, mainly Alliance and Freedom Party. And uh, before we move on from health care to, to topics like education and taxes, um, you, you, were, you were saying, Paul, that uh, uh, we, well, I guess we were just discussing caps and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, Freedom Party is not going to put a cap, but, but yet, it, it, what, is going to turn, uh, like, where's the money coming from? If, right. if, well, yeah. currently, when, when the federal government says that it has a surplus, what it really means is that it's taxing too much. Mm -hmm. uh, and, it, you know, it's been saying that it has a surplus. To mm -hmm. my mind, that means it's taking too much money away from the people who earned it. Mm -hmm. 
That tells us also that there's room to allow the provinces, if they need the money for health care, to raise their taxes while the federal government lowers them. And I'm not suggesting there be a tax increase. Far be it for me to suggest one. But I'm just saying that if the federal government is uh, doing a poor job at something that it wasn't even meant to be doing, mm -hmm. it shouldn't be doing it at all. It should be leaving it to those who have the proper authority to do it. Why are the, why George are the, has a question. Well, why are the provinces at this stage making such a fuss about uh, funding from the feds? They keep demanding more money from the feds for health. But that is, to my mind, a political thing. Uh, if you can blame the federal government for your own ills, for your own shortage of funds, for your own mismanagement, or the failure to open up the system to competition, then you can, you can score a little bit of political, you can share the burden of the political downside when, you, when your uh, health care system is failing, as it seems to be across Canada. You can say, it's not our problem, it wasn't your provincial government, it was the federal government. And the federal government does the same thing right back. Now, if, if the feds cut off the funding, right. how, is it, how will the province make up the difference? The provinces would make up the difference if the federal government, at the same time that it cut funds, cut taxes. In other words, if you, if you stop returning to the provinces a uh, billion dollars for health care, then you should also stop taxing that billion dollars out of the hands of the people so that, if need be, the province can pick up that billion and spend it itself. In other words, why bother giving it to the, the federal government who will then give it back to the province when the province can take it directly, if need be? I just find that whenever I go down traveling south of the border, Canada has a great health system. Whether we have problems with it or not, that's beyond. They feel somehow that the Americans certainly admire it, or a lot of them it. do. I yes, don't know. A lot uh, of them do. Uh, maybe that's the problem with distance. I mean, uh, we always look at the the grass is greener. Exactly. Let, let's move on, if if we made it to to um, from health to education. Now, now sure. the Freedom Party. Uh, one of the one of the platforms you, it was important in your introduction was education. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, what's uh, what would you do to change education in order to improve it? Obviously, well, we want improvement if we're going to change. Sure. Uh, one thing we can do is remember that it, like health care, is not a federal issue. The Constitution grants exclusive power to the provinces in matters of education, mm -hmm. and historically, this has been one of the greatest agitators, the biggest agitating issues for Quebec. They see a federal government that is holding money over Quebec's head and saying, if you want the money, you have to play to our tune. You have to uh, bend your education to our cultural mandates and et cetera. Uh, Quebec has, for several years, been angered by the fact that the federal government is intruding in provincial matters. And we're finding this now uh, in the West as well. Uh, education at the federal level would not be a priority I, I, for I'm curious, the Freedom Party because as, it's not a federal As matter. you're talking, Paul, I'm trying to think of an example, and because I can't, sure. can you give me an example of federal intrusion in a way that would irritate? Is it in subject matter? Uh, is it in, is yeah. it, uh, I mean, I don't know of anybody who irritates uh, the Ontario teachers more than Janet Ecker, and she's Queen's Park. Right. Well, the, <laughs> we're talking there about uh, primary and secondary care, and, and the federal government has not really been involved in primary and secondary funding that much. You're Their talking about universities. Is, that's correct. And what, in un, what is it about universities, then, that the federal government is doing that, uh, say, well, Janet Ecker might take umbrage uh, to, then, or... Um, the education minister in Bernard Landry's cabinet. What are they doing right. that's so offensive? In Ontario, uh, we've historically not cared about the federal government uh, usurping provincial power, largely because we've been wealthy enough not to feel the effects and of it. largely, too, because Ontario feels it is the federal government. And it is let's Canada. Let's not forget, <laughs> and, and that's much resented uh, by many other provinces. Mm -hmm. In Quebec, if assuming you're a professor, for example, in Quebec, and that you're dependent for your department funding on uh, federal monies, which is what happens. We mm -hmm. have NSERC grants and et cetera mm -hmm. coming from mm -hmm. the federal government. Mm -hmm. NSERC, you, perhaps you better just... National Sciences and Engineering yes. Research Council. Yes, and NSERC, social science money for history and exactly. English. Exactly. Now, you, you will find that there is a huge political component in obtaining one of those. If you, have, if you are a, a person who thinks that it is appropriate to teach your students that the provinces actually have exclusive jurisdiction in matters of health care and, and education, and then if that is one of the things you want to write about and you need some funding for your writing mm -hmm. or if you need some funding for your projects, you will find that you will not get it. And I've, so I've, heard, I've heard that yeah. argument and I'm yes. a little dubious about it. 
well, that, that I, any I, granting agency would say, no, that's not a topic we like, but that's debatable and we could spend the next three days to discuss sure. it. Now. Well, I mean, there, and there's also a large amount of sexism at the federal level when it comes to those awards. In Literally, favor of women. In favor of women. Uh, yes, there, I... <laughs> there, there are certain awards that people cannot even apply for unless they happen to be females. Yes, I, I, I've, I've right. seen that argument too. But is, is that such a major thing? No, but not for the Freedom Party of Canada. I mean, our again, our focus is on things that would matter at the federal level. Mm -hmm. These healthcare and education are primarily uh, provincial matters. Mm -hmm. At the federal level, we're concerned about things like uh, taxation in particular. Take, for mm -hmm. example, uh, the flat tax, which seems to have died on the on the agenda for the Canadian Alliance, but which would be a very active part. Which I think they always denied when it, <laughs> yeah. they ever. I, right. Isn't that right, Pat? That well, the we called it a single rate of tax. Well, yes. oh, so uh, that it isn't quite <laughs> dead, but it's by a different name. It's, it's still on the books, uh, and I'm sure prior to the next election it'll be revisited and uh, it'll, it'll be reaffirmed as a, as a uh, party platform or it'll be, uh, it'll be rejected. Uh, it's certainly a very valid position to take, though, and if they're in a favor of a single rate of tax, I can certainly support that. Since we've got a, a, a former teacher on our, our panel, uh, George, have you any questions about education? Not, in the well, not really, in that he made the distinction between the uh, university and mm -hmm. community college and the secondary mm -hmm. and uh, elementary. Mm -hmm. And my expertise has been in the secondary mm -hmm. and, uh, and elementary, mm -hmm. specifically secondary. Mm -hmm. And there has been no intrusion, to my <laughs> knowledge, at that level. No. That's, that's no. my... I, I think... It, what it, I would it, like to see, though, yes. is, is some more cooperation between university and secondary mm -hmm. so that the transition from mm -hmm. one to the other mm -hmm. would be much more smooth than, mm -hmm. than it is now. Mm -hmm. But that has nothing to do with what we're mm -hmm. talking about. Mm -hmm. I, I think uh, some of those complaints in universities, or indeed the, Can the Canada Council, which is another quasi-educational department in, in, in a sub-department in Ottawa, is people who get turned down and I've been turned down for Canada Council, sure. we'll always find a reason. It's because our subject matter isn't right. right. Uh, you know, I think you have to take with a grain of salt some of those complaints, some of them. Yeah. And others are, I think, maybe, maybe, maybe valid. Um, Can I get into something yes. on the arts especially? Yes. Absolutely. Okay, well, according to this document here, it says the Freedom Party is opposed to laws that prohibit the marketing of legal products and services and in favor of lifting the financial bar barriers that, w that could be, uh, that c would, would prevent thriving of arts and sports communities. That's right. Mike, what do you do? I have a concern with uh, advertising with uh, alcohol and, uh, and, and tobacco, for example. Mm -hmm. And are you saying that you uh, permit that sort of thing, that you are, uh, support that kind of advertising in the, in the sports arena? Absolutely. I mean, there are many harmful products. Uh, if that is the criterion we should be using to decide whether or not to allow somebody to advertise the legal product, then I would suggest, oh, well, then we better ban sugar, candy, anything that rots Automo your teeth. Automobiles. Automobiles that pollute the air, uh, factory work. Why not just advertise a peaceful yeah, tree-hugging existence? Uh, I think it's, it's, very, it's very hypocritical also for the federal government to put such high rates of tax on such things as el uh, alcohol and, and tobacco, and yet to say they can advertise uh, on the one hand, the, the government is using uh, tobacco and uh, alcohol to, to fund itself. And on the other hand, it's saying, you evil, evil companies, mm -hmm. how dare you make profits on the health of other people? I mean, this is completely hypocritical. And, and the reality is that people have to decide for themselves whether or not they want to put a substance into their body, be it sugar, tobacco, alcohol, uh, grain. It's up to them. Surely, uh, companies should be required to, to in indicate on their packages what the contents are so that people can make an educated guess. Mm -hmm. But it is a far cry from saying that we will not allow advertising of any sort and the impact on the arts community and the sports community has just been unacceptable. I, I, it really has to change or mm -hmm. we're going to be a lot of trouble culturally. Don't you see more of an impact though on our teens and preteens to that advertising than to advertising of sugar, for example, as you raise, or automobiles or whatever? Well, it's hard to say whether sugar uh, advertising is less in impactful. There's certainly a lot of advertising that goes into selling candy bars, uh, bubble gum, you name it. There's all sorts of things that are causing children to end up with diabetes, all sorts of different health problems. In fact, sugar is probably more uh, harmful to your body than alcohol ever could dream of being. I don't buy into the argument that just because they, they, they show somebody having a drink on TV that it's going to make children run out and have drinks. Absolutely. The greatest pressure children face is peer pressure not advertising pressure. So on the, on, the, on the first phase of Paul's argument, I, I agree with him. You know, if they're, if, they're, if they're a legal substance, then we should allow them to advertise. 
as far as the taxes on them go, our hospitals are filled with people that are there as a result of smoking, secondhand smoking. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's and, the and, downside. And uh, liquor. So I have no problem health with high taxes the as a result of those things. Those tax dollars should, of course, be channeled back into health care, and they should be channeled back into prevention to, to protect our I, youth. I would agree if, if it were to remain the case that the federal government had a monopoly on health care. In that case, what they're doing is saying people who cost us more money are going to be charged more money. But in a system where you have to pay your own way, I think you'll find quite a bit of responsibility be ta being taken for your own health. If you know that your health care is going to be more expensive if you smoke, if you drink, etc., that if you think that, boy, I'm really setting myself up for an expensive uh, hospital stay when I'm 50 with lung cancer, uh, you might just reconsider the whole issue of smoking and drinking to excess. I think uh, that if you allow competition to exist, people who abuse their bodies surely will pay more, but people who are responsible will pay less. Only if we go into a user pay system. You know, it's always and right now we don't have a user pay system here, and, and I don't know of any political party aside from your own. That's a, uh, that, that doesn't support a publicly funded health care system. It's always a sign of a good show when the moderator has to cut off a good <laughs> discussion, but I, I, I have to do it. We can keep discussing this. I like sure. Avi Lewis. He's not on anymore, his show, where he guests just continued as the credits were shown, so don't let me stop you. Thank you, Paul McIver, Freedom Party of Canada. Thank you, thank Pat you. Dunn, Alliance uh, representative, and thank you, George Bradbury, for an interesting discussion. And do, do let us continue as the credits roll. <laughs> Thanks. What about defense? I, I always do.